you all start going into broadcasting and things like that, I think, thinking you're going to be doing all the big, 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 big stuff. And when you start working, you start realizing everybody has a story. And it's funny because people throughout my career will ask me about, and I'm going back more to the, you know, the local TV station days. They'd see you like at a, you know, the World Series, you know, which we did a ton of coverage on when the Tigers won the World Series or something big like that. And people want to ask you about that stuff. And I say this respectfully, but for most pro athletes, you're just another guy with a microphone. But when you're working at a local TV station, you're doing a story on something or somebody local, now you're actually touching someone's life and giving them a memento and you're getting their story out there. So those stories to me became more rewarding very quickly and more enjoyable. And I just, you can get closer to the person, you can really delve into it. I think you can get more creative, all those good things. From cave drawings to family histories to stories around the fire, humans crave order among chaos, connection amid isolation. So we tell stories. Our mission at the Storytellers Network is to bring the art of story to the masses. Whether you are in marketing, you are an entrepreneur, or you're developing your own personal brand, telling your story effectively can make the difference between celebrating milestones and collecting unemployment. The Storytellers Network strives to help storytellers tell their stories so you can learn from the best. Now, your host, the inbound evangelist himself, Dan Moyle. And welcome to the Storytellers Network podcast. I'm so glad you're joining me today. In this episode, we hear from a storyteller in the world of college sports. It is so much fun talking with this guy. He works for the University of Michigan, making the jump from TV news in Kalamazoo uh, over to Ann Arbor. And Ed Kongerski was the sports director at WWMT, a CBS affiliate, where I actually got to know him as a guy who was passionate about telling great sports stories and just telling great stories. Uh, a lot of fun to hang out with Ed. I worked with him there, so that's why I connected with him for our uh, Storytellers Network Video Creators season ender here. Uh, and today, Ed shares with the Storytellers Network his journey from TV into college sports, his storytelling craft, his successes and stumbles, in other words, his story. And as we get into today's conversation, just a friendly reminder, visit uh, the storytellersnetwork.com for more episodes, past episodes, for how to contact me, and for other resources to help you tell your story. And if you're new as a listener, text STORYTELLERS to 31996 to subscribe. Now, let's get to the stories. And thanks for joining me, Ed. Man, I appreciate you taking time to out of your busy schedule. I know college sports are in full session right now, but uh, you're taking time for the Storytellers Network, man, so thanks. Yeah, no problem, Dan. Very excited to be here. This is a really cool thing you're doing. Cool, man. And uh, and so as I said in my intro, you know, we we work together. So this is kind of cool that I get to actually put you on the spot instead of seeing you put <laughs> others on the spot. So that's cool. Well, you know what? That is a people talk about that when I do stuff like this, and it's it's a little you get to see the other side of it. You know how people feel when they're being asked questions, and uh, so we'll see how it goes. Absolutely. Uh, so. I like to talk about the fact that being a storyteller means you can use any platform, any medium, and be anywhere in the world. So where are you right now geographically? I'm in Ann Arbor, Michigan at Chrysler Arena, Chrysler Center. That's where our uh, University of Michigan TV studio is. All right, right on. So you're actually in the studio then right now? I'm in the studio where we do post game with our basketball and football players and our coaches, and we shoot green screen content and hype videos and all kinds of stuff. So a lot of the stuff we do is right here in this room. Very cool. So you get, you get access to all that then as, as the person they're creating videos and stuff then, huh? Yeah, for sure. Our offices are literally just through a couple double doors right there. So this is our, this is our complex. This is our playland. Nice, man. This is where we make our magic. Very cool. So do you consider yourself a storyteller, Ed? I do. I absolutely do. Uh, I wouldn't say I started my broadcasting career thinking that, but absolutely. So when you talk about starting your broadcast career, so obviously you, you came from the TV sports world. What did you think that... And I'm still there, just a little differently. <laughs> <laughs> right now, yeah, internet and, and that kind of stuff, right? Um, so, so what did you think of yourself back then as, a, as somebody coming into TV? Did you just think of like sp scores and stats kind of a thing? Or what, what did you think of yourself as? Well, you know, my... The person I kind of looked up to when I was a kid was Ernie Harwell, the, the retired... I shouldn't say retired, the Hall of Fame, the late, great Ernie Harwell baseball announcer for the Tigers. And uh, I always wanted to, to do games. And I've done that. But my career path took me into broadcast news. And that's where you kind of learn quickly that, you know, storytelling is such a big part of captivating an audience. So I started out just wanting to do games. 
went into TV news and just the opportunities there to tell stories are just limitless. And so talk to me a little bit more about that. It's like you said, it's not just the numbers. It's the story behind them, the athletes and that kind of stuff. How do you kind of find those stories and, and choose which ones to tell? Well, you know, you, everybody has scores and highlights when you're talking about like local news or whatever the case may be. So, you know, you want to do things to differentiate yourself. You want to do interesting, original content. And you just, I guess I'm trying to think of the best way to put this. Um, you just got to dig. Um, you talk to coaches, you go online, you look for different resources. Uh, you chat when you're at games, when you interview somebody, you ask things that might spark some background information that maybe you can use at a later date. Maybe you can use on that story. Mm-hmm. There's just limitless possibilities, but it's all about just connecting. It's about wanting information and seeking that information. And I've always kind of had that in me. So that's kind of, you know, it's funny because my wife will tell me sometimes you ask too many questions just about like simple things like plans for the holidays or whatever. I'm just like, I'm a storyteller. I'm a reporter. I like asking questions. I'm really sorry. I know it drives you crazy sometimes, but that's just kind of who I am. So, so you're always on a lookout for those stories, basically just being connected and open and ready to tell them. Yeah, you really are. And then, you know, there are times, you know, you want to do something, you have an idea for something that's unique or original, and then you just, you find the interview subjects. So at the case at the university of Michigan, um, I did one of these stories a couple years ago. I'm working on another one where I I talked to some of the kids about the numbers they wear and why they wear those numbers. Mm -hmm. So that was an idea of mine that nobody brought to me, but now I have to go find the athletes and ask them. And by the way, some of the backstories are fascinating. It's unbelievable how, how people got to wear the number they, that they wear competing here or other places, you know, other schools, other teams and so forth. And it, and it kind of comes back to, it sounds like it, the, the idea that everybody has a story, right? They really do. They really do. I, I had an idea once that it was just too labor intensive. So we never got into it, but we all know the Steve Hartman kind of, everybody has a story and, and the stories he does on CBS news. So I wanted to do a thing where we, we picked say a high school team. Okay. And we picked a number and we did a story on that person, no matter what that story is. And I think everybody has a story. So you're going to find something interesting about that person. Uh, that was a concept that, that never came into fruition, but maybe it will, you know, someday uh, at another place. Yeah, that's cool. So, so going back to, to our time at, at WWMT, you know, I remember working with you on the, the Friday football, you know, in, in West Michigan, <laughs> which is where I'm from. Man, football is pretty big. Not, not as big as Texas, probably. No, no, but it's, it's <laughs> important to people. It's not, yeah, yeah it's not an obsession but it's clearly important. It means a lot to people in the towns. And that was a lot of fun working on those with you, with, with you guys. And uh, so, so take me back to that. How, is that kind of the same thing as far as finding those stories? Is it, is that the most important part of that night is knowing the coach that maybe has an undefeated season, but has something going on in life or like, I mean, I remember hearing some of those stories and that just, is that just really good networking and listening still like well you know the actual friday night friday night was kind of more just survival mode yeah well, <laughs> but, that's true. But, but but when you're at a game though you talk to people on the sidelines you know as you're shooting or covering a game so you know you might be talking to an administrator from a school it could be a parent uh just somebody with a connection to that team that program you know then during the week you would go out and go to practices and things and that's your time to talk as well you know you just you just start asking about hey anything anybody with an interesting story on this team Hey, we know what, what's more of your backstory, you know, what, what makes, what drives you, what makes you tick. You just always kind of have to have that mentality, I guess, because you never know when you're going to miss something. Right. And speaking of backstory, where does that start for you, Ed? Where, where did you kind of realize you were a storyteller? Is it when you got into TV or was it before that? Did you chase that down because you knew you were? No, not really. I, I guess I just, I always had a thirst for sports information. I loved sports growing up. So I was, you know, back in the day, pre-internet, I was the kid that, you know, ran out to the paper box and got the paper in the morning to look at the sports section and study it. And it it just really came from my love of sports. And when I was trying to decide on a career path, I'm like, okay, I love sports. What can I do sports related? Well, I wasn't a good enough athlete. I played high school sports, but not good enough to make a career of that. Thought about coaching, probably could have gone that path and been very happy. But then I thought, you know, sports journalism, sports broadcasting. And then once you get into it and then you learn about it and you know, the, the people in athletics are so fascinating to me. When, whenever I do 
like a school talk or something like that, a presentation, I, I often mention that part of my motivation to do my job is just being around these highly motivated, um, really successful people and the drive they show every day and the time commitment and the commitment to each other. And I, I really truly believe this. I, it may sound corny, but I think it makes me better at my job, makes me a better person because there's like a standard there you want to live up to. You know, when, when you're going and talking to these really successful people, you know, you want your story to be really good to represent what they represent. You know what I mean? So it just kind of evolved for me once I got into the industry. I, I don't consider myself a lifelong storyteller, but I always had that inquisitive nature about asking questions. So those two just kind of came together, athletics, inquisitive, asking questions, and, and there you go. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I know from TV, you start small, you know, tiny market maybe or whatever, and doing, you know, not only sports casting, but, you know, the janitor work or whatever they have you doing. Right. Is that, and, and I imagine for most writers, it's kind of the same thing. Most storytellers, like you're not going to write the great American novel or create the, you know, a, a Steven Spielberg film as a video creator, like we're talking about this season. Um, so, so how was that for you going from like, like, like what was your journey to go from small time into where you are now? Yeah. How many, you know, a lot of stations, like how does that work? Really good question. Uh, I started out by doing an internship when I was in college uh, at channel 12 in Flint and learned a ton there, just being around those people. Um, worked with Fred Human, who's a sportscaster at Channel 6 in Lansing, and one of the most you know, talented storytellers I've ever seen or been around. Um, the man's incredible. My first job was in Alpena, Michigan. Yes, there's a TV station in Alpena. It's a little CBS station. I stayed there for one year. I was a one-man sports department. I did everything, and I made tons of mistakes and tons of really embarrassing mistakes probably on the air that I can't even recall anymore. But you, you learn, you learn quickly. It's, it's literally sink or swim. I remember one of the highlights I remember from there was they have a, uh, the Brown Trout Festival every summer. And I was told I need to give like a nightly leaderboard on the Brown Trout Festival. And I was just like, you're kidding, right? <laughs> but no, they weren't kidding. And you know what? It was cool. It was important to that community. So when you start working as a storyteller, when something's important to somebody, there's a story there. There's something to tell. So from there, I moved to Bismarck, North Dakota. Worked there for about five years uh, as a sportscaster, sports reporter. Did a lot of really cool things there. Um, just, you know, covering local sports. I went to Minnesota Twins training camp because out there they, they followed the Minnesota pro teams. We covered and followed North Dakota State, North Dakota. A lot of cool stuff there. Covered championship boxing there. And then from there I moved to Kalamazoo to Channel 3 where I stayed for 19 years. Hmm. And just, you know, you, you refine your craft along the way. You know, you you learn how to interview people. You learn how to, to listen to people. And you know, hopefully you, you fine tune your writing skills and those storytelling skills. You know, people talk about TV. It's such a visual medium. Sometimes I think we forget the writing. The writing in television can make or break a story, just like the visuals can. But good visuals with bad writing is not a great story and vice versa. So then about three and a half years ago, an opportunity came here at University of Michigan Sports Television where we... Um, we produce the football and basketball coaches shows and we just do video reports on any and all of our teams and they air on all the platforms, the social media platforms, video board content and things like that. So that's kind of been my journey, Alpena, North Dakota, West Michigan, and now the university of Michigan. That's cool, man. And that's, and that's I, I think it's, I mean, I just think it's really cool to work for the U of M. You know, I'm, I'm not tied to college sports necessarily, but like, man, the Wolverines, I mean, that's a pretty legendary school. So. That's awesome. Well, you know, there's a lot of eyeballs on our work. Yeah. So again, there's that, that standard to want to do well. A lot of people care about these programs and it's not, you know, it's not just football and basketball across the board. There's, you know, 31 varsity sports here and really, really successful sports here. So you really want to uh, uphold that standard that's been set for years and years and decades and decades of what the university stands for and the commitment to excellence uh, that they have here. Yeah. Now I want to go back to what you said about writing and, and TV. Now in season three of the Storytellers Network that we're in right now that we're wrapping up, I'm all, it's all about video creators. So I wanted to talk, talk to you about that. But I like what you said about uh, there's so much more than just, you know, basically what I heard was there's so much more than just a camera in your face. Let's do some video. Like there's, there's writing, there's sound, there's everything. How, how do you see video as a storytelling craft versus other platforms? Well, video is so powerful because you can you, you capture the, the emotion, I think, in a better way, you know, versus the written word. And I, and I love reading and I love writing. Uh, but the video, you know, 
I would say the video doesn't lie. I guess it can lie, <laughs> but, but you know, it just captures the emotions and there's so much creativity with video, with storytelling, with angles. Um, you know, as you know, working in news, you know, there's, there's catchphrases you live by. And, you know, when you're shooting a story, it's one of the things I love is wider wides and tighter tights. Give me those really, really wide perspective shots and give me the shot like this so I can see the emotion on the person's face, whether they're competing or practicing or sweating or crying, jubilation, whatever it may be. But it's, it's raw emotion. That, that's what I think it is. And that's the biggest thing about the video component. I just feel like it's raw emotion. And if you can capture it the right way and present it the right way, it's really, really powerful. I mean, I, 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 to follow up on that, I just saw a yeah. great story last night by uh, a friend slash colleague of mine, Lisa Byington, who's a sportscaster. She did a story, Matt Millen, the former football player and the former Lions general manager. And he, he's, he's a very ill man right now. And she did a really powerful story with him and his battle with his illness. And uh, the visuals, I'd heard about it, I'd read about it, and then I saw this story and it, it really brought it home. It really brought it home what he's fighting with and the way he's handling it. It's just the tremendous positivity he's facing a, a life-threatening situation. Hmm. And, it, and that, that story, I mean, the, 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 especially the visual medium, it really connects you to that person even though you're not there in the room with them, doesn't it? I mean, it, it's, it's powerful. Yeah, yeah. It, it really is. And I think that's, you know, that's why people gravitate and, and you know, they, they think they're friends with their local TV news anchors and reporters because <laughs> they see them every day. And then yeah. people see you in public and they're like, I feel like I know you because I watch you every night. And hopefully they're saying you do a good job and I like the way you do this. And, you know, friendly, approachable, all those things you, you want to show on camera, you know, those, those genuine traits you really want to show. Yeah. Now, so, so I, I hear a lot of passion in your voice. Clearly, you love sports. Um, sports is a huge industry, huge part of our lives out there. And it's funny because I, I went to a, a TEDx uh, thing the other night in Kalamazoo, and Tim Hiller was speaking. Oh, my um, gosh. Great guy. You know Tim, right? Great, yeah. great communicator. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, phenomenal speaker, man. It was so good. And it's funny because so many, you know, when you think of TEDx, you think of so many things that are really like out there kind of, not not like weird and whatever, but just just really highbrow out there kind of thing. Yeah. He's talking about sports and you can, and a lot of people probably listening, maybe say, Oh yeah, just sports, you know, whatever it's, you know, throwing a ball or whatever. But really what Tim was talking about is what, what I find fascinating is that so many, like 70% of executives in America are some, were some kind of a student athlete. When it comes to women in leadership, 93% of them were athletes. So really sports is such a, it's so much more than just running down a field or on a court or whatever, or for me, it's ice. Um, I love hockey, yeah. but I mean, so I guess my, my thought on this is it's such a powerful platform to create things like leadership. And, and as we're talking about stories, how do you, have you ever given that much thought as to like how powerful sports really are? I mean, what's your heart on that? I, you know, I have, and Tim Hiller, by the way, for anybody who doesn't know, was the former record-setting quarterback at, at Western Michigan that, that we're speaking of. Yeah. Um, you know, I have, but um, – so I'm kind of losing my train of thought here. <laughs> That's all right. Go, re-ask re re -ask the question. Well, I just wonder, you know, some people will say sports are just this little thing that you can do, and, and you know, your kid's not going to be a pro athlete. Don't worry about sports. Just, you know, go read a book or whatever. Like, sports be kind of kind of has be can, can be in some people's eyes, I think, a, a pastime, a hobby, uh, you know, n nobody should be in sports or whatever, like it's overblown. Yeah. But I think in reality, it's more powerful than that. It, it really is. The leadership perspective is incredible. Uh, it really is. And just, you know, working with people, being able to handle adversity. Um, there's so many traits you need to be successful in life that you learn on a practice field, during a game, in the heat of the moment, disappointment, you know, coping. There's just so many things. I, I, I live that as a young athlete. I, I, I refer back to stuff that happened to me that has helped me in college, beyond college in my professional career. But there's, it's, hard to put a, it's, it's hard to explain it, I guess, properly if somebody hasn't competed in athletics. But it, it really does. It, it makes you makes you better it makes you better it really does and it makes you more well equipped to deal with everything life throws at you and we all know life throws a lot at all of us you know <laughs> different times different moments whatever um, there's always going to be peaks and valleys throughout your life 
And I think athletics just prepares people for those sorts of things in a, in a big, big way. Yeah. Um, so I want to get back to something you said earlier, uh, talking about the wider wides and tighter tights. And, and it made me think of technology and how we've got all these different tools at our, our disposal, whether it's, you know, you even referenced that social media, you put videos on social media platforms, you know, Facebook live drones, um, all these, all these different kinds of cameras, technology shapes how we tell our stories. How do you see technology playing a part in your storytelling? Have you found some really cool stuff? Have you found that it makes you lazy? Like how does technology fit into your storytelling? Well, um, I guess there's different ways to look at that. Presenting the work or, or doing the work, you know, doing the work, just technology, just, it changes so fast and it, it, it enables you to get closer to a subject, maybe while they're competing or something like that. You know, I'm thinking of like GoPros and things like that where, mm-hmm. you know, cameras are so small now and they're so mobile and gimbals with moving video and all those things kind of bring it to life. And then when you talk about, you know, just getting your work out there, all the platforms you mentioned, you know, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, you know, our website is a resource for us here at the University of Michigan to get stuff out there. So it's just, it's always changing. It's always a challenge, but I think it allows you to do your job more efficiently, allows you to do it, you know, quicker. You know, you know we have a challenge every Saturday night after a football game, our coaches show has to be done by Sunday morning. And there's a couple guys in our staff who stay up literally all night, most weeks, putting it together. And you couldn't have, you couldn't have done that kind of show, you know, 10 years ago, and not as quickly. And I'm talking more like, like we're remote. So we're on a road and we're sending video files back, you know, mm-hmm. um, high quality HD. Now, you know, you can do satellite trucks and feeds and things like that. But the digital age has just, you know, made, made the workflow so much, so much different. And, um, I think it opens up your creativity. You know, we try to do that a lot here. We try to get creative and put GoPros and cool, crazy spots and, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. I and mean, we, at the NCAA tournament last year, I can't recall if it was the regional championship, whatever round it was, you know, we put a GoPro on the ceiling in the locker room and it, the water was flying up and they were celebrating, you know, like cool, you know, just completely bizarre, cool stuff. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a little bit of a smart ass here. Every, every technology is a, is a home run every time, right? Have you ever found, yeah. have you ever found, uh, let's, let's try something and it just doesn't work? Yeah. Yeah. That happens. I mean, nothing's jumping out off the top of my head, but some, absolutely. There are times things don't work, but, but that's the creative part of what we do is that we're always looking for something new and different that maybe somebody hasn't seen before. So, you know, you try, you don't always hit a home run, as you said, sometimes it's, sometimes it works, but it's not as great as you thought. It's a single or a double. And you know what? Those are okay too, as, as a piece of a story, but you know, the real home runs, you swing for the fence and, and you hope you clear it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as a storyteller, do you have a story that's changed your life in some way that you've either told or heard or whatever? Oh boy. You know, <laughs> I will say a story that changed my life is the story I did to get the job from Bismarck to Kalamazoo. Cause I feel like that was such a pivotal point in my career. Uh, it was, you want to hear about the story? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it really was, it was a good story. It, it was, you would think it'd be something local out in the, some small town in North Dakota, but the Minnesota Timberwolves were out there playing an exhibition game and be a preseason game. And I did a feature on one of the guys, he was a rookie. His name was Danielle Marshall from UConn, great basketball player. And I did a, a cool story, the Timberwolves. I got this like howling wolf, you know, kind of sound effect. And we did a couple cool things and, it was a good story, a solid story, but I think it was creative enough where it got someone's attention and um, showed that I was a thinker and all those kinds of things. And that was this, one of the stories I put on my reel to get the job in Kalamazoo. So that, that kind of changed my life because it, you know, I moved back to my home state of Michigan. I got to do a million cool things working at Channel 3 that I'm so grateful for. And it helped me just fine tune all these skills we're talking about, the shooting and writing and editing and communicating and asking questions and and all those things. So, so that story, story I did, you know, inadvertently, I guess, changed my life. But other than that, you know, there's just so many motivational stories that you tell or you see through your career that they all, they all add up and, and they all just mean something. And when you, so you, 
when you reference that that basketball player, I'll admit I'm not a basketball fan, so I don't know if he's a big name or not. It doesn't sound like it, but yeah, he was a pro for quite a while, but not you know not a star, but a good yeah. solid pro for you know, ten years or so. He's no he's no LeBron, but he's he's a, he a big deal. Um, Correct. But then you also referenced you know being in Kalamazoo, obviously Derek Jeter from Kalamazoo, a big star, and that was always a probably a fun thing to do those stories. I want to ask you this though, Ed, when it comes to these stories and, and being a storyteller and a story sharer, really. Um, does it matter do you think big talent versus small you know famous versus unknown do you have so i guess my, my two questions number one do you have a favorite you know is, is famous your favorite or is kind of underdog your favorite and then also the other the, the follow-up would be which one ends up getting you you know more viewers or more of an audience do you think for the storytellers wanting to grow well you know you all start going into broadcasting and things like that. I think thinking you're going to be doing all the big, 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 big stuff. And when you start working, you start realizing everybody has a story. And it's funny because people throughout my career will ask me about, and I'm going back more to the, you know, the local TV station days. They'd see you like at a, you know, the world series, you know, which we did a ton of coverage on when the Tigers were in the world series or something big like that. And people want to ask you about that stuff. And I say this respectfully, but for most pro athletes, you're just another guy with a microphone. But when you're working at a local TV station, you're doing a story on something or somebody local, now you're actually touching someone's life and giving them a memento and you're getting their story out there. So I, I really grew pretty quickly. It took a few years, I guess, but a few years where I enjoyed doing the more local stuff, the smaller stuff, because there's, you know, a lot of people know things about the big time athletes, okay? I'm probably not going to get a scoop interview with LeBron James, to your point. But there might be a kid on a small school football team or a small school softball team or, you know, or from a small college, um, you know, a minor league hockey team, great backstory, you know, guy's career. Those stories to me became more rewarding very quickly and more enjoyable. And, and I, I just, you can get closer to the person. You can really delve into it. I think you can get more creative, all those good things. And there was another part to that question about impact. Um, you know, the big flash is always going to have an impact. There's no question. I would hope people that consume, you know, broadcast video stuff, I would hope that it would have a discerning eye and want to watch more than just that, that they'd want to see stories from, from local people in your community, perhaps, or, or, or just a real inspirational story of somebody who's overcome a, a great obstacle, which there's a lot of them out there. A lot of them don't get told. Most of them probably don't get told. But when you can tell one of those, uh, I think that has an enormous impact. It really does. And so when, when it comes to getting those stories out and, and building that audience and getting, having that impact, um, you know, we, we've talked about TV, we talked about internet, social media, you've created a platform. Well, you've not created, you live on a platform that's been created. How are we supposed to get those stories out there? Do you struggle still, even with your platform, to get those stories heard and seen? I don't, I don't think we struggle with it. Uh, there's always a challenge to, you know, to get more, you know, if you get 20,000 views on a story on Twitter, you know, you want 20,001, you know, <laughs> um, you know, so, you know, those challenges can become, you know, time of day and when you put it out there and all those kinds of things. And, and we have a, a digital media department that, that does a really good job of kind of disseminating, you know, our stories. So we kind of rely on those folks to do those kinds of things. Um, it's always a challenge, especially now there, there's so many things competing for people's attention and, and you miss stuff. You know, you're on Twitter, you're on Facebook, you're on social media platforms. I mean, you can miss stuff. It's very easy. If you, a lot of, if you follow a lot of different things, stuff can blow by and, and you don't even see it. So it is a challenge. I mean, it's man, the, the world's moving fast <laughs> and everybody's, you know, they're going in different directions and you're trying to get them to slow down for a second and, and see something that you're working on or something you've worked on. But again, I go back to the platform we have here at Michigan, where there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people connected to, to the, um, all the sports here. So we have that built in audience, but we want to just grow that audience as much as we can, because a good story, a good story could be a football player, a field hockey player, a baseball player, a swimmer. And it's still a really good story that hopefully somebody enjoys watching. I love it. That's good stuff, man. Um, well, I, I appreciate you taking the time today. Ed. This has been fascinating. It's great to reconnect. I want to, I want to wrap up with one more though, before I let you go. Yep. Uh, you're not getting off the hot seat yet. <laughs> if, uh, if somebody said to you, all right, Ed, you're all done being a storyteller. You got to go do something else. And you had to tell your one last story. What would that story be for you going out on? 
what would be my last story to tell? Wow. You know what? It wouldn't have to be something epic as far as grandiose. It would have to be well-written, first of all. It has to be well shot and edited. There'd have to be something in it that would make people think, something that was said or something in the script. And I want something visual that somebody's gonna go, wow, that's really cool. Whether it's a creative shot, creative editing, creative use of some other visual elements. So that's a good question. That's a real stumper, but I just want it to be clean, concise, and impactful. And I think that'd be a good way to go out without, you know, I don't need fanfare. I just want to go out as, as somebody that maybe did what he loved and did it well. And hopefully people can see that and sense that in the work as they watch it. Hmm. It's a great way to, that would be a great way to go out for sure. And, and I guess maybe the, the lesson is we, we as storytellers strive for that every day so that if it is our last story, we went out with quality, right? Absolutely. No question about it. Awesome, Ed. Well, hey, man, what's the best way for people to, to find you or just, you know, U of M Sports or how can well, they connect so, with you? Yes, our stuff's out there. Our, our coaches shows, they, they air Sunday mornings in Detroit on, on Channel 7, but then they're on Fox Sports Detroit throughout the week. They air them multiple times throughout the week. And there's a couple other stations around the state that carry them. MGoBlue.com, we have a lot of stuff. And then our, our Twitter and Facebook pages for our respective sports uh, carry our stuff. And it's amazing the reach those things have and, and the impact those things have. That, that's where most of our stuff lies. And just, you know, I'm on Twitter, um, you Mish Ed, follow me. There's some pretty good stuff on there. Cool, man. We'll put some of that in the show notes and let people connect with you and hear your stories. Dan, I really appreciate you reaching out and, and thinking about me. I, I think this kind of stuff is great. And, um, you know, storytellers, we got to help each other, look out for each other and um, just, you know, promote our work any way we can. Yeah, man, for sure. Awesome, brother. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. All right. Thank you so much to my guest, Ed Kongersky. Be sure to visit him online. You can find links to all those resources for University of Michigan down in the show notes. And if you enjoyed the episode, please consider sharing it yourself all over the place, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Snapchat, Instagram, wherever you want to share, email it to somebody. I appreciate it very much. Uh, you can also, if you're new, text storytellers to 31996 to subscribe. So you can get a new episode every week with me. And please consider leaving us a review. In fact, here's a short and sweet one from Entrepreneur on a Journey. Storytelling connects us. Glad to be connected to Dan through this podcast. Great show. Thank you so much for the kind words, Entrepreneur on a Journey. Uh, see, a review can really be that short. They all help show other listeners, uh, potential listeners, that it's a great quality podcast. So I appreciate it very much. Thanks. Hey, until next time, here's to telling our stories, having those stories to tell. Cheers. Thank you.